You ever have one of those days when every traffic light you hit is green? It's kind of like that, only for investing. Motley Fool Money starts now. I'm Chris Hill. Joining me from the Great White North, Mr. Jim Gillies. Thanks for being here. Thanks for the invite. It's not very white this morning. It's still we're still in the last throes of uh, of, of autumn. So. Uh, where I am, at least the the snow's coming. It's already landed in Alberta, but here it's a very nice day, Chris. You know where else it's a nice day? On Wall Street. <laughs> I was just gonna say practically everywhere on Wall Street. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a great day for investors because the consumer price index rose just zero point four percent for the month, seven point seven percent for the past twelve months. Both those numbers lower than expected. And investors are having a party, Jim. The S and P 500 is up four percent. The Nasdaq is up nearly six percent. We were chatting before we started recording. You you think this could be a sign? I absolutely think this could be a sign. Well, anything could be a sign, but yes, I do think this is a sign. This is what I mean. Just we are going to fly the risk on banner, right? Like it, it is here because uh, this is the first real hint that you know inflationary forces are starting to subside. Uh, that now. What does that mean? Well, uh, interest rate hikes have been have been uh, doing what they are designed to do. Uh, certainly, the quantitative tightening program is ongoing. Uh, I believe I'm not following along terribly closely, but I, I know I've been reading things that they actually might be going too far in that. That's you know that's selling bonds into the market rather than buying them under quantitative easing. Um, but rates. If it, the, the thinking goes, if if in, if rates have indeed tamed inflation, uh, then we won't need as many rate hikes going forward. Which means the pressure, the unrelenting pressure on stock valuations, uh, you know, stock stock prices, asset prices, and interest rates are inversely correlated, or discount rates when you're looking at stocks uh, are inversely related. So lower rate hikes, or even no rate hikes, translates to no further stock price falls in aggregate, thinking goes. Uh, I can't speak for individual stocks. Uh, and uh, possibly, you know, a time for stocks to go up. So this is being rejoiced. My my take on it is, you know, these CPIs like really they really like to get revised. They, you know, they revise them a month and three months later. So I'm not going to be the unfettered flying of the flag here of the risk on flag. However. I think the takeaway is if if this CPI number is good, if everything looks indeed good, then from a market perspective, real good chance the bottom's in. Now, that does not address the the possibility of recession. Although I've kind of been in the skeptical camp of how how recessionary are we going to get? I mean, there's been a lot of you know been a lot of really good corporate earnings reports this quarter, frankly. I know it doesn't seem that way sometimes because the ones that uh, stink up the joint tend to get all the attention. No, I think, it's, really- I, I think it's fair to say that this earnings season has been, on the whole, better than expected. I think there was has, a lot, absolutely. Of, a, a lot of fear, uh, and fear slash resignation going into this earnings season. Just sort of like, oh god, this is going to be terrible. Let's just get through this. There have been some nice surprises. There, there have been a, a lot of nice surprises, and the and the other thing is, you know, like I, I know it's uh, like uh, uh, I'm generally not a macro guy, but that said, I guess we're dabbling in macro right now, so I might as well throw it into the ether. The macro um, is the reason that they're throwing a party on Wall Street. So yeah, exactly. today we're, we're macro well, people. <laughs> you know, it's real hard to have recessions with the, uh, with the employment numbers we've been having, and. Yes, I understand that uh, various tech companies are laying folks off, not just Twitter. I understand that that's kind of a uh, there's kind of a, a lot of job pressure on what I'll call uh, technology space workers. Uh, but I don't think you're seeing that in the industrial space. You're certainly not seeing that in the energy patch. Uh, I don't see, think you're seeing that in a lot of the the day to day nine to fives out there. I. I still think the employment picture looks pretty good, and uh, 
recessions generally have to weigh heavy on on uh, job numbers in order to actually gain traction. So, you know, I mean, I'm I hope I'm sounding a note of cautious, cautious, cautious optimism across uh, various places. Again, individual stock prices can go many different ways, but I think in aggregate, I, I, I think things look pretty good. Let's talk about an individual stock price moving in different ways, because shares of Bumble were down 15% before the market opened, because Bumble's third quarter revenue was lower than expected. Their guidance for the current quarter was lowered. And yet, the stock is in positive territory. I'm assuming that's due to the CPI. But this is this is one of those businesses I think you and I have both watched for a while with interest because it's it's in an interesting space. It's in you know the it's the dating app for for those unfamiliar. Um, they are going up against a pretty formidable competitor in Match Group. Um, which has such a huge market share with all of the different brands under the Match Group umbrella. And after a, a wonderful debut, what, 18 months ago? <laughs> yeah, I mean, boy, they timed that IPO spectacularly. I was just well. going to say say whatever else you want about Bumble's business, about their management. They timed their IPO wonderfully going public mm-hmm. in February of 2021. They did, which is practically the peak for uh, what I'll call sassy. That's the software as a service. Sassy, techy, growthy names. February 2021 was the absolute peak, and then you can go track all those, uh, all those types of companies and see what they've done. Uh, probably the broader market's been down for about a year since about November of 2021, but really the software things peaked at that time, and uh, you know and. There was Bumble IPOing right in the middle of it, and and I think Bumble offers a lot of really interesting lessons. But always remember, an IPO, you are buying something that the people who know it best in the world are selling. That's any IPO. Now, is it a is it a, a move to cash out for a founder? Is it a move where the founders are raising capital, take the business to the next level? Those are both uh, perfectly valid reasons to IPO. But you know, you should always be a little bit, you know, you should always have a little bit of skepticism when it comes to IPOs. I I have a rule that I try to avoid IPOs for at least a year. I want to see how they're going to behave publicly. I want to see if the uh, the projections they put in their roadshow presentations actually pan out. I've got a you know a few names I could post up for you where you know one of my favorites is a uh, is is a is a, a long running retailer in Canada that you know when it was under private equity it was running at about three to five percent revenue growth but then magically in their roadshow to ipo to re re debut uh magically they were going to do 14 16 percent annualized revenue growth going forward after the ipo and i'm like no it isn't uh and funnily enough they haven't and the stock's down 90 percent of its ipo because that was a type of ipo where it was private equity getting out that wasn't Bumble. You know, Bumble is, from what I understand, I don't know the full uh, the full details, but uh, from what I understand, the founder of Bumble came out of Match Group, the much larger competitor, um, and she uh, uh, Bumble is a different style service. It basically puts the control of contact and messaging uh, in the hands of women rather than uh, men. As a man who met his significant other on uh, one of the Match Group uh, websites many years ago, uh, I feel that's a good idea. But, you know, I'm not in the market for go- for Bumble right now anyway. Um, sorry, my dog is dropping things in here. Oh, I thought your dog was just laughing. <laughs> no, she's... You know, Literally dropped a bone on the hardwood floor. Thanks, dog. But no, I mean, like the 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 lessons I think you can take because I actually think Bumble has a good brand. I think Bumble has an interesting niche. I think it's a niche that Match can probably replicate without too much um, effort. They already haven't, but um, but I think it's something that uh, uh, certainly if you've heard some of the horror stories and certain online dating scenarios. Uh, I happen to think this is a good idea and their innovation is a good idea. Um, but because you like a business, the lesson I would suggest is because you like a business, it doesn't necessarily mean 
you should like the stock. And so the story of Bumble is the IPO in February 2021. The IPO price is set at $43, which was actually higher than the price they originally wanted. Uh, and even that wasn't enough. The stock went stupid on day one, closed at 76 bucks. I'm not sure, $75. I'm not sure it's ever closed that high again. A year, and here's why I say take a year. A year after the IPO, Bumble is down 63%. Okay. And yeah, it's fallen another about a quarter since then, but at least you've spared that first sickening plunge. And another reason why you want to let, I mean, you know, you know, if you want to play lottery ticket games on day one and try to buy and sell, fine. I mean, you know, but that's not investing. That's just playing games. Uh, but you know what? That money spends the same as money earned from, you know, the most well thought out investment in Berkshire Hathaway. So, um, but valuation as well is something that I want to show here. So valuation matters. I know it's not, I'm not one of the cool kids when I say that. I know we periodically go through periods of, of the market where you could pay anything you want. Think of the nifty 50 in the seventies. Think of the tech bubble in the late nineties, early two thousands. Think of frankly, the SAS names in 2020, 21, uh, you know, the valuation just gets forgotten. Uh, and usually if you try to challenge people with that, it's like, well, I'm a long-term investor and thinker. It's like, oh, I don't know, man, Intel and Cisco are still down 22 years later from the tech bubble. I don't know how long-term you are, but you know, that's, that's pretty long-term. <laughs> and so from a valuation perspective, Bumble at its IPO is valued at over 15 times revenue, 80 t 82 times EBITDA, 266 times price to earnings. Um, and, and all I would say is, do you have any idea what the growth numbers Bumble has to put up in order to justify that level of valuation? Um, high, by the way, and they've done fine, actually. But, you know, today, Bumble is down, as of today, Bumble is down over 72% from, from its IPO price. And today's valuation is, is instead of 15 times sales, it's about four and a half times sales. So that multiple is compressed by 71%. Instead of 82 times EBITDA, it's now being valued at about just shy of 16. That's an 81% compression. And the PE has gone from 266 down to 13. So 95% multiple compression. Now, I don't know what happens from here for Bumble. But I guarantee you that scale of multiple compression will not repeat. Or, or, or if you'd like to make the argument why Bumble will trade at less than one times earnings, please, by all means. Um, so, so the multiple compression has happened. I can't help you if you bought at the IPO, but looking at it today, the valuation looks much more reasonable. This is a business that is produced that has grown. I think it's 16, 17% in the last year, about 19% in the last two years, uh, a top line growth that is EBITDA and earnings. EBITDA is roughly followed, but it's a real, real niche producing real cash flows, growing cash flows. And you can now kind of look at it. What's a cash flow based valuation look like? Uh, like I said, good niche with the, the female-centric, female-driven um, uh, customer model, like that. Uh, there's some warts on the business. I mean, like there's too much you know, it's a software company or a tech company, too much stock-based compensation. That happens pretty much everywhere in this space. I was going to say, that's kind of sta table stakes, isn't it? It kind of is, yeah, but it doesn't mean you have to pay for it. But you know, you just have you have to build it into your models. The returns on capital haven't been terribly great, so they might be overcapitalized. Uh, they're still very much a second place to to the much larger match group. And in fact, I would think they'd probably a good exit might be a buyout by match group. But uh, like I said, I they, Bumble did come out of, or the founder of Bumble, she was at Match, I believe, with Tinder, and uh, I don't know the story. I know I've heard rumors, but I, I, I think there's some bad blood there. So I'm not sure that Bumble would willingly be acquired by Match. And I believe the founder slash CEO of Bumble has uh, voting control such that, that she could just veto any, uh, any overtures, hostile, friendly, whatever. Uh, so, you know, I mean, there's, there's not an obvious near-term exit if they wanted to sell the business to the largest logical acquirer. Um, but maybe private equity comes at them. But you know, I, I I like I like looking at IPOs, what are called busted IPOs, a year, two years after they come out, when all of the excitement has just been washed away. People kind of go, ugh, and you can say, okay, is this a real business? I obviously think it's a real business. Um, is it a re real business at a reasonable price? It's certainly a much more reasonable price than it was. 
And, and so I thought, you know, in a, on a day when everyone's chasing pretty much everything, um, and, and again, this was down in the pre-market, as you said, uh, you know, this was the one that I kind of, this was the one that I kind of gravitated towards going, you know, this could be an interesting story and something probably worth digging into more. And that was before the CPI print made us buy everything in sight. But no, I just, I thought this was interesting. Jim Gillies, great talking to you. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chris. GitLab's revenue year over year is up 74%. But like many other high growth tech companies, its stock has taken a hit in 2022. Motley Fool contributor Jeremy Bowman caught up with GitLab CFO Brian Robbins to talk about how GitLab helps other companies develop software and the trade off between growth and profitability. Maybe we can just start there. So, what is DevOps? And maybe you know, explain it to us. Like uh, you know, we've never heard the term before. Yeah, absolutely. It's easily explained with an analogy. So, let me start with an analogy. Before the iPhone, and I would travel. I would literally pack, you know, a Walkman so I could go run in the park. I'd pack a camera so I could take pictures. I had my Garmin GPS in case my map quest that I printed out didn't work. I would literally take a duffel bag of electronics. Then came the iPhone. It was a single application that brought all that together for a terrific user experience. GitLab is a leading DevSecOps platform, and we basically bring all that together for developers to create software. And so it's, it's, it's a single application. It's the most comprehensive platform that allows your developers, the security individuals and the operations people all to work at once to create software. So we produce software better, faster, cheaper, and more secure. So it sounds like GitLab or your DevOps platform is, is replacing a lot of, uh, individual solutions. Is that fair 100%, to say? hundred percent correct. Um, you, when you deploy GitLab, because it's an end-to-end -end platform, you can replace a lot of point solutions. And that's why um, Farser actually did a report on the company and the payback for three years was a 407% return. And the number one thing that companies can do is reduce point solutions. Number two is they don't actually need those teams to actually um, orchestrate all those point solutions and maintain those. Third, the developers are way more efficient because they can produce software a lot faster. And fourth, to the extent that the application is revenue producing, you actually get that app out in the market quicker. And so you get revenue faster. So you guys have been a pretty fast growing company. Um, I believe that your revenue grew 74% in your most recent quarter. Um, so what, what do you see as, as your growth opportunities going forward and, and what's driven growth for the company historically? Yeah. Great question. You know, every company has to become a software company, regardless of geography or vertical. And since we enable companies to make that software, uh, like I said, better, faster, uh, cheaper, more secure, every, a lot of companies have used us. And so, you know, we have approximately 60% of the fortune 100, you know, around 25% of the global 2000, and people are using the platform to create their software uh, to get out to market quicker. You know, an interesting stat is, um, you know, the company is about 10 years old, a little over 10 years. And, you know, we started selling into the, you know, selling the software about seven years ago. Cohorts from seven years ago are still expanding with us today. Cohorts from six years ago are still expanding. And so we are barely penetrated in this really, really large market. We believe that the total addressable market for our products is about $40 billion. And, you know, this year, you know, at the midpoint of guidance, we'll do a little over 400 million. So we're barely penetrating a really large market. And so, um, like every company, you know, is, uh, should use our product, uh, to create their software. Right. Yeah. Something I learned too about GitLab that's, that sounded interesting. A lot of software companies are focused maybe only on the enterprise level, you know, the largest companies out there, but it sounds like anybody can, even one person can, can sort of sign it, sign up for GitLab and, and start, start there. Absolutely. We have a, a free product um, and we have about 30 million registered users. And so there's a number of people, either educational, not-for-profits, um, individuals who you know, use it just to do their own coding. Um, but whether when you sign up for the paid product, whether you're a, you know, a, a shop with five engineers 
or 5,000 engineers, it's the exact same product. And so we don't customize it for any of our customers. Everybody gets to use the platform, the GitLab platform to make software. Imagine that makes it easy for companies to scale up with it as well. Absolutely. You know, any company, especially in the public markets faces competition. Um, so how do you see the the competitive landscape for, for GitLab? Um, and who would you say are, are your top, top competitors? And how do you think about your uh, competitive advantage? You know, it, it, it's funny. The, the main competition for us is the point solutions that we talked about. And we call that DIY DevOps, do-it-yourself DevOps. And basically what companies are doing is they're buying point solutions in every stage of the software development lifecycle. And then pulling those together um, with Bubblegum and Bailwire to basically create a platform-like experience. So when, you know, for the last several quarters, uh, the numbers have been really consistent. So in about 50% of the deals that we're in, we don't see any competition. From a named competitor standpoint, the the largest named competitor, we only see in about 20% of the deals. And our win rate is almost identical, whether they're in the deals or not in the deals. Um, And so, like I said, it's a really enormous market, about a $40 billion TAM. Uh, We're just getting started and it's super exciting. So when you, when you say 50% of the deals you're competing for, you're, you're not seeing direct competition. That's you're, you're, uh, you're facing off against those point solutions. Is that they're making software today, but it's unknown to us that any, anybody's in the deal because they're talking to us and it's not like there's a competitive RFP out there. And so when you go through all the Salesforce notes and about 50% of the deals, there's no known competition there. And so they currently have probably the, the DIY do it yourself DevOps, where it's a bunch of point solutions that they've put together. What kind of feedback do you get from, from those kind of companies then if they're, they're only used to uh, working with point solutions? You know, it's, it's, it's an evaluation. Um, we try to remove the friction out of the sales process on both the buy and sell side. And so whether you buy our self-managed product or our SaaS product, we charge absolutely the same. Uh, we only have one price for premium and one price for ultimate. And then we have our free tier. So we only have two prices. Uh, so when you're consuming the product, we want to try to take all the friction out to make it easy. When we're selling the product, we're doing the same thing as well. And so we are not trying to compensate our sales team on selling ultimate versus premium or selling SaaS versus self-manage, we go into a customer and first identify what their problems are. And then the biggest thing that we want to really do is get time to value and drive business outcomes. If we if we do that, and we know this from historical practice, those customers will con- to continue to expand with us and be with us for a long period of time. As far as, uh, you know, and, and for, especially in the software sector these days and, you know, valuations has come, have come down and there's, I think there's a debate in the market going on between growth and profitability and which, which is more important or what, you know, how to, what's the proper way to balance it. So, so I'm curious that GitLab, how do you think about profitability and, and, or, or, uh, what do you see as maybe the proper balance of investing in growth, but also showing investors, uh, you know, profit potential. Yeah, absolutely. So, so GitLab, um, yeah, I've been here. I just had my two year anniversary and I was thinking about, I, I get asked this question periodically. And so I was thinking about, you know, the best way to answer it, to convey the message to the investors. And since I've been at GitLab, there's really been three discrete phases that I can identify at the company. And so right when I joined, we were doing this, we, we launched a secondary on NASDAQ private market and sold roughly about $200 million worth of stock for team members. And we had a couple hundred million dollars of cash on the balance sheet. Uh, that was way oversubscribed. We could have t- taken some primary, but we didn't. That was phase one. Phase two was going public. And so we went public. Um, we just had our one year anniversary of being a public company. So it was about a year ago. And um, we re- we had roughly a billion dollars cash on the balance sheet. October of last year, revenue multiples really, really high. And people were saying revenue, 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 grow at any cost. Um, and then phase three is today's market, right? Revenue multiples have come down. Um, all companies are saying cash flow break even, cash flow break even, cash flow break even. Um, throughout those three discrete phases, the messaging that Sid and I have delivered to investors has not changed 1%. We said the number one thing we want to do at the company is grow, but we'll do that responsibly. And so every quarter since we've been a public company, we've increased the operating leverage in the business and have delivered improving unit economics while still growing at really, really high growth rates. And so, you know, I'm really happy to say like in the two-year period, 
The messaging has been completely the same. The market has really turned, but we hadn't, we have not operated differently with almost a billion dollars on our balance sheet or $200 million on our balance sheet. We have a long-term operating plan that we continue to drive towards and really happy with the performance that we delivered last quarter and what we continue to deliver. It sounds like your, your unit economics have steadily improved over, uh, at least in, in your public history. Is that, is that correct? Absolutely. hundred percent. We, uh, you know, just last quarter that we reported second quarter, you know, second quarter last year, we did roughly 58 million in revenue. We did 101 million in revenue this past second quarter. So we added $43 million of incremental revenue and did that at the same absolute dollar loss which drove about a 1500 basis point improvement in operating margin. And so super happy, you know, even in these markets to deliver those results. Um, but that's the key of what GitLab does. It's a mission critical software package that helps any company create software. And so really fortunate to be where we're at. And as I talked about, one of the reasons why I joined GitLab was because of the tailwinds, you know, we're in an industry now where, as I said earlier, every company has to become a software company. So we're very well positioned. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.